Hey everybody, welcome back to the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And last time around, you looked at the back half of a Coptic Orthodox church. And this time around, my dad's going to be showing you the front half where all the communion and services are held. So here's more from the St. Paul's Coptic Orthodox Church in, in Chicago, Illinois with Father James McHale. Enjoy! That was awesome. It looks like maybe we've got some incense in here. And yes, yes. So this is our sensor, and even this, even this. So everything really has um, a lot of meanings to it. So if we look at it, even we, we, you know, we'll start with like the very, very top. We see three different cords, uh, always connecting it. Take any sensor from anywhere, and you'll see the three different strands. And the three, of course, are uh, symbolizing God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they are one down the middle. The incense is found in many places, like in Isaiah and in Revelation. Okay, sure. And, and the incense is basically, it's the prayers. Uh, that's what's, uh, I can't remember the verse or chapter, but definitely in Revelations, it's the prayers of the saints. So it's, it represents prayers. Every time we're going around sensing, it, it's kind of like a reminder. Again, no magic other than... We use physical things to remind us, hey, you know, stop wandering. Don't, don't think about the, the, you know, the pregame show of football here. You know, I'm going around with incense. Maybe say, lift up a prayer, you know, because mm -hmm. basically the smoke is like prayers. Like they, the smoke goes up just like prayers go up to God if we say up, right? Um, so it's, it's our symbol. All this is a symbol. It's just reminding people. We use something physical to remind people of something spiritual. So the smoke itself is prayers. We have the... Uh, so, and we say it, it, there is incense, so it's a sweet-smelling uh, flavor, which is, which is Christ. Christ was a sweet-smelling flavor uh, on the cross. It was, a, it, was a, it was a sacrifice, but we also call it a sweet-smelling sacrifice, a well-pleasing sacrifice. Um, we have the, the coal representing Christ himself. Uh, so it's got the, the humanity and the divinity. So it's got the physical part, but then the divinity part is the heat. And then who is basically bearing the human and the divine? The Virgin Mary, St. Mary. So we consider this, this part as St. Mary's womb. Okay. So where Christ was, where Christ was born in her womb. So we, this is a symbol of her womb. The Catholic and Orthodox would be in agreement on the idea of uh, Mary is like the, the new Ark of the Covenant. The, yes. The language of the God-bearer is... Yes, yes, God-bearer, yes. Okay, this is beautiful, beautiful yeah. imagery, and I had no idea. I would have walked up and thought that this was entirely a functional design by a sensor manufacturer <laughs> who's like, this will keep the stuff from spilling, this will make it all work, and you're telling me everything all, means something. All the symbols, yeah, it's beautiful. it's beautiful. I love it. I'm guessing these are just so you don't burn your hands real just bad. Just so you don't burn your hand, <laughs> yeah, and these are the... All functional. This oh, is all functional. We, is this, fun that's the actual. That's an incense puck. I mean, what do you call uh, this? Can I touch it? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I went to yeah, go yeah, and touch yeah. it. No, it's it's just the coal. That's the same thing that's in there. Um, exactly. Just places that we can we can wow. put it in, and we light it up. It it starts. It just goes. So I mean, it it's designed to burn well and burn slow. Like how we used to barbecue. That's what I like here. <laughs> uh, speaking my language. Um, so these candles. Is this how you? So yeah, you light would, this. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a candle there, so that if you basically because obviously this will last for I don't know 20, 30 minutes, and you need another one. Uh, the person who is the altar on the altar deacon would come and light a candle, take another one, light it up, and then he would put the next one in, so that when we're putting incense in, there's something in because this obviously will go to ashes. Okay, that's fascinating. And so, uh, when when in the service. Do you use this? You said you go throughout, censoring. Yeah, throughout. Uh, definitely. So I, I mentioned like three major parts to our, so the preparation, which okay. we call the raising of incense. So guess what? There's a lot of incense <laughs> okay. in the raising of incense, both the evening and the morning. That's probably a lot. So I, I think, I'm trying to think quickly, almost, almost the whole part has the, the priest incensing at one point or another. Okay. Um, then in the liturgy of the word, I mentioned that we have certain readings. The first reading is the, the Pauline epistle. And what does St. Paul do? He went everywhere, missionary journeys. Sure. So what does the priest do when we read the Pauline epistle? He goes everywhere. 
So are you reading and, and taking no, I'm a not big reading. fiery thing with so you? So we have readers, so people are reading. Okay, so whoever's they're... got the thing that could burn stuff down, they're keeping track of just the fire. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the, I, I'm the only one that actually senses. So while they're reading the Pauline oh, Epistle, okay. Okay. And, and everybody, so everybody, again, so this is our, our doctrine part, our teaching part. Uh, somebody, a deacon would be reading. Okay. Everybody's sitting down, paying attention. And I am going around the, the whole entire church, uh, sensing all the icons, but also all the people. Uh, because, okay. because people have Christ in them. So I'm not sent, same with the icons. We're not sensing, we're not, you know, it's always, everything is centered about Christ. Everything is about Christ. And maybe that's some of the things that maybe throws yeah. some, some people off in terms of what are we doing here? That sounds everything, like us. Everything is about Christ. We yeah. worship Christ. Uh, he is inside us. So if he's working through a saint, we, we, we venerate and we, we're, we're, we're happy that, that Christ worked through St. Anthony, that he's working through you know, St. Saint, Saint Paul, the apostle that we have right so there. So these aren't lesser deities. These are you and me. So uh, you and other me, vessels through which Christ the could work. Exactly. Perfect yeah. word. And I think that's a really easy thing for outsiders to misunderstand. Yeah. I mean, so we use it through the liturgy of the word. Usually, again, at those parts, there's another reading of another reading of the uh, Catholic epistle. Uh, and, and that was more, uh, sorry, uh, so the, uh, the Catholic epistle and then the Acts. Acts, where did, where, was, where, where did everything happen in the book of Acts? Jerusalem. <laughs> so we don't leave. So okay. physically, I don't go around the church anymore. I'm just right here. Oh, we, okay. I see. I'm right here. So I'm setting here because in the book of Acts, they were just in Jerusalem. Um, so that's why we, so there's a part where we go all around because St. Paul went all around. In the book of Acts, we read the book of Acts, but that was in Jerusalem. So I'm staying in Jerusalem. So you, mean like, you mean like Peter so and the apostles yes. staying in Jerusalem? Yes. Before it shifts to before Paul. Before it shifts to gotcha. Paul. Gotcha. I'm tracking. Yes. So when you say sensing... Yes. Can you spell the word sensor for me? C-E-N-S-O-R, sensor. So it's spelled. Or I-N-G. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's not like the five senses sensor. Oh, no. Yeah. Correct. Okay. With so it, it affects the five senses. So your sensory organs will notice what the sensor is doing. Yeah. Okay. English yeah. is a funny language. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm tracking now. I, I, yeah. Forgive my ignorance on yeah. that. Yeah. So, so we do this for part of the service, and then it yes. sits here and continues to smolder, and everybody's smelling this. So this I brought this. out for you, uh, because this is sitting on the altar. Oh, okay. So the altar, obviously, is very, very special, and we only go into the altar, uh, again, very, very briefly in the preparation services, but definitely in the liturgy. We, I don't even leave the altar once okay. the liturgy starts. So, so is this so I brought this on out. it? Yeah. So it's this sitting is, up there. It's just sitting um, on that little piece of carpet over there. Okay, right on. You're telling me that most of what you do during the service yes. for you happens up here. So yes. are you behind this altar piece? In front. In front, so okay. I will, um, in, our, in our tradition, we actually remove our shoes for the altar, to okay. get onto the altar, and we, when we partake of Holy Communion. Um, so I am, contrary to maybe other, I'm always facing uh, God. So it seems very rude, uh, but I'm not looking, unless, I'm, unless we're reading, and unless I'm, I'm giving the sermon right after the readings, the rest of the time I'm actually facing east and, and worshiping God. So the, the priest is not, I don't, I don't want to say any, anything differently, but the priest is not there to entertain, he's there to lead the worship. So I am, you know, standing basically with hands up like this, uh, just praying, praying the whole liturgy of St. Basil uh, until finally at the very end where we partake of the communion where I, uh, I do that, where exactly where you're standing. Okay. So outside the sermon, and then obviously when I go around to sense, and then Holy Communion, the rest of the time is all in there. Okay. And so what am I seeing on top of this here? Um, so inside here, so this is basically after every service, uh, all the, the, the utensils are, are, are packed, are, are wrapped in a certain way. Um, so that when we even untie, we even have prayers. So we even, even just to untie this, I have prayers that I do. <laughs> uh, so we untie. What is the prayer of untying? How does that go?
I'm sorry, that was a demanding question. It's just so yeah, curious. If, to if me. you want me to say it, I could say. I'd it. love to hear it's the. Really preparing the priest, reminding him what what great honor uh, we have as priests that we 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 lead this this part. Uh, so it says, "O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, who is holy, and who rests in His saints, who alone is without sin and has power to forgive sins. He is without sin. He has the power to forgive sins. I don't." You, O Lord, you know my unworthiness and unpreparedness and my lack of meekness for your holy service. And I do not have the countenance to draw near and open my mouth before your holy glory. But according to the multitude of your tender mercy, pardon me, a sinner, and grant me that I may find grace and mercy at this hour. Send down to me the strength from on high that I may begin and make ready and accomplish your holy service after your pleasure, according to the assent of your will for a sweet savor of incense. That's that sweet savor. Yea, our master, be with us and be a partner working with us and bless us. For you are the forgiveness of our sins, the light of our souls, our life, our strength, and our boldness. And unto you we send the glory, honor, worship, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and all times, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. I love the way your tradition has framed these things and the thoughtfulness mm. to have a prayer for unwrapping the, the cloth. That's just, that's incredible to me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. I, I know sure. I keep putting you on the spot and asking you to read stuff and do church, but it means a lot. Sure. I mean, do you want me to unwrap this? or Are you allowed to? I, I mean, I just said the prayer. So. Okay, so so if you didn't, you wouldn't. I, I would say the prayer. I mean, I'm, I, if I'm not going to prepare the liturgy, I would at least, like what we always do is we, we sign ourselves in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And we always do all the three major signings of everything. So Wait, I'm sorry, what are the three? The three. So... First one, blessed be God the Father, the Pantocrator. Pantocrator means all, all knowing, uh, the Almighty. That's the name of the um, the icon I see this of one. Jesus a lot, right? This the one, yes, correct. Pantocrator. Very good, yes. Okay. Second signing, blessed be his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and then untie. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Another Greek word, uh, Paraclete means the Comforter, the Helper. Uh, it's the name of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then the other two. So that's why the, whoever's rapping has to do it in that way. Three knots and then two knots. We say glory and honor, honor and glory to the all holy trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. So after I said that prayer and after I do the, the, the signing, then I can actually prepare the altar. Um, I won't prepare everything, but you asked what was, what was here. So we have... Uh, all right. So we have the chalice, which we will put the wine and water. So again, the wine and water that came out of Jesus' side, the wine and water. Uh, and, and you mingle that in the chalice? We, that's exactly the word we use. Oh. Mingle. <laughs> well, it, I mean, I, I picked that word because of miaphysitism. I know I'm saying it wrong again, no, but you right, said it mia, means mingle. Yes, and so I assumed yes, yes. you were Perfect. drawing on the same imagery. Yes. Yeah. So first we prepare the altar and then, then we have an offering. Uh, let me show you what else is here. All right. So let's get this guy. And then we have a spoon. Which we use for uh, giving communion to the whole congregation. And the covering, of course, again, you can think of back in the day. I mean, there could be flies. It could be. So we make sure that we don't want anything to come into the chalice. So this is covered almost all the time. So this is not representative of like the shroud or the burial garments. It's practical. Practical. Okay. <laughs> all right. So let's get this all out of the way. And this is just really just so that the, uh, the plate, which we call the paten, will, will sit upon.
this is an amazing process. What does doing all of this process in itself, what is it meant to communicate? What does it mean that it's so elaborate? Again, I think and a lot of it is just functional. So remember we, what I mentioned in terms of the pearls, making sure that yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. So you can see that everything is white except for one thing. This one is red sitting right on top of the plate. Why? I mean, of course, red, yeah, we could say the blood of Christ. Really, so that I can see the, the, the crumbs, the pearls. Oh. So that if it falls, I can see it. And again, we, that's how we don't want to lose anything. So if it's white, I can't see anything. So we use that. So a lot of it is functional. Maybe it's looking. Um, I wasn't taught anything in particular in terms of like, why do I have to use six? And I think it's just more just... I think it's aesthetic, a little bit of aesthetics, but then this is the functional part so that if something's falling, it's falling on these veils. And then at the end of the liturgy, I put every veil, like I make sure I shake them into the plate before. I don't just throw yeah. it away. I make sure that nothing is spilled. So I make sure that everything is being um, shaken into the plate. Wow. Okay. These are functional. These are functional. So we have an offering. Right? We have a sacrifice. You mentioned sacrifice. There's a sacrifice every time. We call it the rational sacrifice. But um, what wait, wait, rational sacrifice, like in the sense of Greek rationalism? Yeah. Like, or like in terms of this makes sense. And yeah. Like, I mean, it's not a bloody, it's not like a physical sac. We're not, we're not okay. sacrificing no animals. No. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's more like on mine. It's, it's, a, it's a sacrifice because Christ's sacrifice was once and once for all. Saint so Paul it is said. kind of that platonic Aristotelian idea of, of rationalism, the, the abstraction that is given physical expression in something. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I tripped over your shoes. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry about that. I should have just left it there. Let's see, I should have done a better job in, in actually preparing, but. No, you didn't expect me to show up and hassle you and badger <laughs> you for every single detail. Uh, so this is, this is what uh, somebody will prepare every Sunday morning. Uh, so who will prepare, um, this, which basically is a circle, and so this is half. This is from yesterday's uh, liturgy. Um, so um, if we can imagine just a full circle, and then this is what's being offered. So we start the liturgy. So, we, so even before the liturgy of the word, I didn't mention this one. Let me get this so we don't have any accidents here. Okay. Before the liturgy of the word, we have what we call the offering. The offering. What's the offering? is we're going to choose the best bread. So we can say bread because it hasn't become the body. Ah, so the so, bread. So this is not the body of Christ. No, this is not the this body of This is some bread that you this have are holding bread. right now. Okay, got it. This is bread. Uh, we would basically uh, it, it would put some in this offering plate. Mm -hmm. And then the deacon would basically be standing uh, almost where you are. I'll, let's say where, I, where the deacon would be. Okay. And then I would be standing here. Okay. As he's holding this, choosing the best one. Why the best? Okay. Because Christ is the best. So he's here holding he's this here for offering. you. He's here offering. Yeah. He's sorry. He's here holding, and I'm choosing the best one. Okay. Um, um, so there's again, if you can imagine, seven seven of these, you know, that are circular inside, and each one basically uh, would have a stamp, and the stamp says, "Holy God, Holy, Mighty, Holy, Immortal." It would have 12 crosses representing... In, in English the, or in Coptic? In, in Greek. Yeah. In Greek. Yeah. Okay. Agios, Othios, Agios, Yesheros, Agios, Athanatos. Holy God, Holy, Mighty, Holy, Immortal. So that's in Greek. It would have 12 crosses representing the 12 uh, disciples. Um, and then, again, we choose the best because Christ is the best. As we kind of like symbolizing the Old Testament where they take a, an unblemished lamb. So this we say, O Lamb, just like St. John the Baptist says, O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We say the exact same word, O God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O, yeah. Lamb, o Lamb of God, sorry, O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. So the same verse we, right. we say, and we're looking for the perfect Lamb. The okay. perfect Lamb. So the, the unblemished. The okay. unblemished. So, you know, so one that looks like a circle. Sometimes, you know, people would would make it more like an oval, more like a football, put that aside. So why a circle? Because God is, you know, has no beginning or no end. Right. So we choose the most perfect circle. We choose the one that has the least blemish 
because Christ has no sin. Uh, and again, we're choosing the best. So again, uh, the best of what we have because Christ is the best. Um, so that's what's going to be put on the altar, put on the plate. May I ask what happens to the six you don't pick? Yeah, they get distributed at the end uh, to the whole congregation at the end. To so take we're all them, sharing. To take with them and eat. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because so that's still dismissal. bread. It's still bread. Yes. Okay. Yes. So all the other ones, uh, basically everybody would come and partake of like, kind of like the same bread uh, right before having breakfast together. Okay. So the unchosen stuff, like you put some jam on there. Or, I mean, you just, it's, it's just bread to eat it's and enjoy. It's just bread to eat. Okay. Yes. I'm understanding. So this moment of choosing, though, it doesn't become the body of Christ at the moment of choosing. No. There's something more that happens. Prayers. Okay. Yeah. All the prayers. That happens a little bit later. So we have the offering. So the offering is kind of like prepper. So basically, I, I, I take this, um, and then we would put it on the, I mean, we, we, there's, I mean, there's a whole liturgy. We, we actually take it and wrap it, just like Luke 2, and like Simeon the elder, where he wrapped, and, and he held the, the body, so, and went around the altar. I do the exact same thing. So I'm doing okay. Luke 2. Uh, you know, when we wrap it, it's like Mary wrapping Jesus in swaddling claws. Uh, we put water on it, uh, functional to take, make sure that we take away any flour. But uh, some people say it's also a symbol of, of his baptism. Okay. So we're going through the whole life of Christ when he was wrapped, when he was baptized. We actually have a burial. We actually have a resurrection. Okay. So the burial is this whole, this whole huge veil is going to be put over the whole altar, which, which is representing burial. But guess what? The first thing we do after the sermon, when we start the Liturgy of the Faithful, we have a resurrection. We remove it. So Christ is risen. So He's again, risen indeed. It's, it's, whole, it's going through the whole life of Christ. Um, so even this part, so that's why I put it inside out. So when we do the burial, I cover this so that it becomes obviously the right way. And then I cover it with the whole thing as well. Um, so there's some functionality in terms of that question you were asking mm -hmm. about functionality mm -hmm. uh, and meaning. So uh, this, this, this was the one. So the first one, so this was covered here. Let me just go back. All right. So I grabbed the first one. So I'm, at this point, I'm vested into white uh, in this part of the liturgy. So I have okay. something else that's put white. And I put it in my sleeve, kind of hide it. I hide this in my sleeve. And then I offer. Sorry, the, the, then we, we do the offering. And when I choose the best one, I take it out. Okay. What is this representing? This is Abraham. <laughs> Abraham hiding the fact. He's hiding. So we say this How is the knife. About that? This is the knife. So, uh, so you're, you're referencing the Abraham and Isaac story. Abraham and Isaac, right? Which is Abraham, Abraham and Isaac is definitely the sign of the cross, right? With God the Father and, and his son. So we're doing a little bit of Abraham and Isaac. And then I take this, which was the knife. And then that's also going to be what we're going to use to cover, uh, like I said, uh, cover the, the, the bread. Wow. Okay. So yeah, so that's the first one. The second one. Right after we, we, like I said, so we put that, we mix the water and wine, we say a Thanksgiving prayer, and, and then we, right away, so it's very, very fast, we, we cover uh, the whole altar, showing that that is the, um, uh, the crucifixion, and then we have a seal that we put on top of it. So the stone, so we have the, the, the and then we actually put this as the seal. So every detail that you find in the Gospels of like what the what what they did, so they had a stone, and then the seal that the uh, the guards that the the Romans put to make sure that nobody's going to take it. We actually uh, relive and do that same thing again, and then the altar is covered through the liturgy of the word until finally, when we start the liturgy of the faithful, where we remove everything for the resurrection. Okay, so, so I, I'm sure you already covered this, but. When it comes time to actually distribute the elements, do you do it like, like we do at my church where you have deacons or elders or whatever you might call them, take them out? Or do the people line up like I see? Yes, B. So that yeah. they come so to you. So that's the table. So we'd roll that to. Ah. So let me put this back. Okay. And in a very uh, orderly 
and very quiet, uh, reverential way while we're singing Psalm 150. Praise God in all his saints. Praise God in the firmament of his power. Uh, praise God. for it. So we're praising God. So we say we're all recite. Of course, everything is sung. So okay. we're singing Psalm 150. Uh, and everybody is coming from uh, the back to the front, and I'm standing here basically giving the holy body to everyone, uh, mentioning them by name. So, you know, the holy body given, oh, yes. you know, given to Matt, given to George, given to Sylvia. Given Do you ask if you don't know someone? No, I just say that. Given to so-and-so here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I say the holy body of, of, of God. Okay. All right. And, yeah. and so, yeah, you mentioned that earlier. So everybody's coming forward, and yes. you actually feed it to them. Is that right? So we do it in two steps. So okay. uh, the Coptic Church does it in two steps. So we, we always give the body by itself, uh, only because we, you know, again, maybe it's just splitting hairs, but Jesus did it both ways. First he said, take, eat, this is my body, and he did that. And then he said, take, eat, take drink, this is my blood. So we, we consume all that. Once we're all done, everybody took the body. We, we bring it back. And that's where I said I clean off the whole entire plate. Okay. 100%. Uh, uh, we do it with water after. And then I come and I remove all this, everything that we put on. And then I take the chalice and exactly, uh, as you mentioned, the same thing that everybody was doing, except now with, so we remove this. We don't need this. And everybody would be coming and drinking from uh, one, one chalice. One okay. Cup. Is so there a theological one. significance to having that come from one cup as opposed to lots of we can little do. cups like we do? If it's coming from one, like for, for like huge, huge congregations, there could be two, four, like it could be more than one. But, it, it's, but everything is coming from this cup. So I can take this and then put it into another cup ah. for functionality, for, you know, to speed up things. Okay. Same with the plate, same with the plate. So, but it's always one, one bread that we take. We, if, it's, if there's more people coming at the end, I can't just take another one and say, oh, there's more. We, we, it still has to be divided. So it's that, like, basically we are all in one body. It's all one body and one blood. So whatever was sanctified, that's what was be, being given okay. uh, in Holy Communion. Okay. And so then this is the end of the service. This is the mm. end of the service. Yeah, I, I quickly rinse them off with water and make sure there's, like I said, no blood, no body left over at all. Okay. Uh, so everything is consumed. And then, yes, we dismiss everybody uh, with, the, with the normal dismissal, which is uh, may the love of God the Father, uh, which we always do with the sign of the cross. So to dismiss everybody, may the love of God the Father. Grace of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Put this down. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have to start over, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> May the love of God the Father, grace of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. So this go in peace, that's the evangelic part. It's like, this is the part where, okay, everybody, now you just received all the doctrine. The great learnings that we did, we all did together in the liturgy of the word. We just received the most precious gift that Christ himself has left us, which is his own body and blood. Now go, go and preach and go and be an example. Go be that Christian. Go be the light. Go be the salt of the earth into the world. So when we say go, it isn't go downstairs and have your coffee, which is what everybody does. <laughs> yes, it's, we're all going downstairs. We're going to have coffee. We're going to have bagels. But this go is to go into the world and be that light and salt and evangelize. So Sunday, on a typical Sunday, you do always, again, everything white. White, again, is angelic. So the deacons, the priests, everybody's wearing white. So this would, would, would go on on top of what I'm wearing. Is this Peter? Uh, this is St. Paul. That is St. Paul. Okay, he yeah. looks different than he does in Catholicism. Yeah. And this one is Jesus. So. Him I recognize. <laughs> we have a vest as well. And then for the major feasts, major feasts, uh, again, for like... Oh, wow. We, we have one a little bit more. We go one notch up for Christmas and Theophany and, 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 uh, and Easter. So we put this on as well. So are these, are these yours or Those are these are the mine. churches? So these I are... I mean... So I, like, yeah. Neither <laughs> the church you were, bought it for me, but 
I'm okay. the only one that wears it. I mean, this is all custom, so it's... That's like, what I was going to ask. So, like, neither you or I are going to dunk a basketball in the next week, no. probably. <laughs> and so, yeah, those would fit me wonderfully, but... Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, those are all custom. Everything is custom made in terms okay. of sleeves and... and okay. Money. And then for uh, the deacons, they have their vestments. It's a bit more... It's similar. Um, so it always has, again, the white... Um, almost very similar to the priest closing, and it has this red stole as well. Again, okay. the red. stole is like the kind of shawl. Yes, exactly, thing. exactly. Okay. That they put on again, white for angelic purity, and then red for the blood. We are saved by the blood okay. of Christ. What are the What are the Greek characters on on these vestments mean? I see him kind of going uh, clockwise around the. Do you see? Oh, this one. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. So this is the Alpha and the Omega. Okay. Jesus is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation. This is a short version of Isos, Jesus. Isos, Pie Christos, Jesus Christ. Theos, Theos is God. So Jesus Christ uh, and, and Theos is God. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. Yeah. Awesome. So this is a lot of detail. It, you learn all this stuff in seminary? Does somebody just pull you aside one day and teach you? I mean, how do you learn it all? How do you keep it all straight? Uh, uh, so like I said, a lot of this stuff, I mean, this stuff a lot of people would know because it's very uh, common because you'll see it in all the crosses. I'm trying to see if there's a cross nearby. Well, I just mean like the liturgy side yeah, of things. Yeah, the liturgy you know? is all during those 40 days of the monastery where they taught us <gasps> all the rites and, and uh, all the actions to take. So 40 days in a monastery to have all of this yes. history handed down to you all the liturgical so the history is again we as our own teaching i mean we have obviously a sunday school program okay. um so through sunday school program through things your own teachings as well um all that is where we get our learning so then do you go to the monastery someday and teach the next guy no no so that there is like so the monastery is uh, full of monks and that's their role, so that they basically they prepare, uh, like one of the roles, so they all have jobs in the monastery. Yes, they pray, but they all have jobs. One's a cook, one's teaching me how to do the liturgy. So that's his whole role, is to basically pass on the rites of the liturgy to the new priests. So if somebody, if somebody walks in the door for the first time to your church, uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're not ethnically Egyptian, mm -hmm. maybe they've never been to an Eastern Orthodox sure. church, but... Say they watch this video and they're like, that makes a lot of sense. I want to go to church there and see what that's yeah. like. What, what should they do? How should they dress? What do they do if they don't know any of the songs? I mean, can you just come to church here? Absolutely. Absolutely. When, what you're describing is something we see regularly. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we have people literally off the streets or we have people who invite their friends. And, and, you know, and they feel bad. I wish they didn't feel bad. But, like, I don't know when to bow. I don't know when to say, you know, like... I would just say, don't worry about it. You know, all this is learned. Like, like I learned everything. Everybody has to learn. So in due time, it takes a good year. It takes a good year to really be comfortable and understand when you bow, when you sit, what's the hymns, what do you do. Um, so I encourage them to just, you know, just look around and maybe just try to follow the rest of the crowd. And, and just don't worry. Don't worry. There's no wrong way to worship. You know, if it's coming from your heart, don't worry. And, and, and as you grow you'll get all the, the lingo, the steps, and, and all that stuff. That'll come. That'll come. What do you guys do when you screw something up? Like if somebody folds up the, the host, do I use the word host in your tradition? Uh, we the, use the body. Okay. Yeah. If somebody like, folds that up the wrong way or the knots are wrong, I mean, there's so many details. I mean, do you guys just kind of roll with it? I mean, yes. it, it's okay? Yes, or? yes. All right, so that doesn't ruin church. It doesn't ruin church. Okay. I mean, you know, somebody you know, drops the coal, look, you know, it's all this is supposed to get to our hearts. You know, they're, they're rituals. They're, if, we all, if we just basically all are about rituals, then we're almost like the Pharisees that Jesus said. What are you guys doing? You know, we're not doing things on the outside for the outside. The outside is there for the inside. So I'm going around. Hopefully people are praying, you know. Mm. I'm, 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 I'm singing a song, then those words should be, should be for mine. So we don't do things for the sake of doing things. And if they're not done right, it's okay. It's all right.
All right, amigos, here's what we're gonna do. I real quick wanna talk about four things that stood out to me from the tour you just watched. And then in the next video, we're gonna sit down and get into the deep water theology stuff, history stuff together. And so if there are things where you're like, oh man, I really wish they would've got into that, hang around for the next one. I bet there's a good chance we're gonna touch on the thing that you're interested in. But in the meantime, here's what stood out to me about this visit. One, I was really struck by how much Father James cared about the continuity side of things, and that was contagious. 1,500 years, you say you guys have been isolated from the rest of the game? Well, that's kind of crazy, because you would expect this gigantic drift to occur. You'd expect there to be modifications and stuff to fit within their own culture and to make things work and to get by and to release some of that pressure that's on them from cultural, political, even military situations, but it's not there. There's tremendous continuity, and maybe you remember at the end of the last video, I was like, so why do you think you got together again after 1,500 years and started comparing notes with other Orthodox Christians? And we're like, whoa, we say the same prayers. We're doing the same stuff. Why do you think that continuity was there? And you remember, he kind of looked away. He thought about his answer. And while he was doing that, just to you know, kind of jab him a little bit and see what I would get out of him, I was like, you think it was luck? And he looked back and he was like, no. And he wasn't angry. It was, just, he wanted to repudiate that. No, well, it wasn't luck. It was God. It was the Holy Spirit. And his argument that I think he made pretty effectively over these two videos is that he believes there's something transcendent behind the fact that their Christianity still looks a whole lot like the rest of Christianity. And well, I'm at least pretty much persuaded by that. I think there's something to it. I understand that there's some of you hanging out here who would attribute that to other things. Maybe you're not quite of the same persuasion in terms of belief that I am or whatever. I, I love that we get to hang out together. And I had no problem with you attributing that to something else. For me, I find it to be a compelling case for the idea that there is a transcendent entity behind this stuff and that, that at least the most fundamental, basic, important truths about that entity, that deity, are something that is being preserved. Now, I also know that there are a bunch of you who hang out with me who right now are in a place in your process of faith where you are much more energized by and much more interested in and see much more consequence in the things where there are deviations and where different groups disagree. And you're in a place where you kind of want to sort that stuff out and try to, you know, get people maybe on the same page and whatever is right. And I can respect that process as well. I'm in a little different place right now. I'm aware of those things. I care very much about those things. I like talking and thinking about those things, but I don't marvel at those things. Those points of difference are fascinating, but I don't look at those and go, wow, that's just amazing. But I do look at the points of continuity and feel that way. I don't look at the points of difference and say, man, that really makes me think this or that about God. It doesn't make me think a lot about God at all. It just makes me think about how those differences evolved and what people do with them. But I do look at this and say, it just makes me think about God. It makes me think about faith stuff and things that are bigger than us. And is anything bigger than culture? Is anything bigger than history? I think Father James is trying to make the case that, uh, yeah, he thinks there is something bigger than that. I'm going on and on and on about this. So that's thing that stood out to me, number one, is the continuity thing. Thing that stood out to me, number two, is the engaging the five senses thing. We talked about it in both two parts of the tour, but just how... You know, the best teachers engage all five senses and memory is attached to hearing and smell and all of that. And the idea that that church smells like the Coptic church is fascinating. That people walk in there and they get that smell on them and they leave with it. Like when you go to a Subway restaurant and the, the yeast, the bread smell there is very distinct. You sit in there for an hour and you eat lunch and you come out of a Subway and somebody else can be like, you had Subway for lunch, didn't you? You're like, oh... Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. And depending on whether or not you like Subway, that could be a compliment or a complaint. But the same thing is true here. Like, I have to imagine that people walk out of church and people are like, you've been to church? Interesting. And it's kind of the same idea. I mean, isn't that what a leader of a church would want, right? Would be that the whole God thing, the, the ethics, the morality, the orientation, the prioritizing, the thinking of others, the serving others, like all the things that are the trademark of the kingdom of God and the stuff of God and the Bible, that that stuff would kind of stick to people, that it would get in the fabric a little bit, and that would people would go out of church, maybe other people would look at that and be like, eh, you've been at church, haven't you? 
that there's something about you that's a church thing. You smell like Subway. You smell like church. And that that tangible element to it is just something I hadn't thought about before. Like the metaphor is there, but the tangible element is is interesting. I have another Orthodox friend. Uh, this friend is Greek Orthodox. He's uh, a monk. And he sent me this recently, and I popped it open not knowing what I was getting. And the first thing that hit me was just this incredible smell that this smells like their church. I've never been there, but I can tell that. And I don't know if this is like some kind of, oh, excuse me, I am a jerk. I just dropped something absolutely precious and cool. And he sent me these things. And it's not just that the the items, I don't know if you call this a crucifix in the Orthodox tradition, and I need to talk to him about exactly what this is for, if I'm doing it right. But the fact that they come with something that is observable in this way, as well as in this way, as well as in this way, is just one more element of engagement that comes with the whole thing. And I don't know, maybe that's something that I've undervalued a little bit. And I know there are people in my tradition who don't undervalue it, but for me, uh, yeah, I've undervalued it. And so I'm compelled by this and I'm grateful. Another thing that I've appreciated about the time that I've spent uh, at the Coptic Church is the enormous intentionality. The fact that everything has come to mean something, it kind of makes sense. If you have church for a couple thousand years, eventually everything's going to move from something that just serves a purpose to something that means something. Because why wouldn't you gradually co-opt everything in the room and be like, well, let's do it this way instead of that. And then it serves as a visual reminder of this truth or this reality. I mean, that sensor having three chords and one in the middle to represent the Trinity somehow. And I know that there are some of you who've watched like the Lutheran satire videos and you're like, oh, Patrick. And you're like, no, it's somehow that represents the Christological heresy about the Trinity. It's a word picture. It's an image. I think you're being too sensitive. I think it's beautiful and expresses it really well. Nothing can fully metaphorize the Trinity, but just some physical reminder of that. That's a pretty cool thing. And that intentionality is, um, I don't know, again, something that maybe I've been a bit neglectful of myself. And I certainly found it refreshing and energizing to look at everything and be like, mm, I bet that napkin means something. Hmm, I bet the way that is positioned means something. I bet the way those things work on your outfit right there, I bet that means something. I bet those letters mean something. And every time I asked, he was like, oh yeah, that means something. Except for like, one doily or something where he's like, nah, it just keeps, keeps the flies out. But I think we can give him a pass on that. So I loved the intentionality. I loved the engage the senses aspect of this. I really appreciated the continuity theme that came up. And I guess I already kind of touched on this one, but I'll reiterate it as my fourth. Uh, just the idea of getting to unwrap this present. Here's a, here's like another simulation of Christianity that's been run. And it's, really encouraging and cool to see how familiar that simulation has turned out, even though I'm from a very different part of the world. So I cannot stress enough how generous it is of people at churches who only know me as some guy from the internet who called them one day to open up their church like this, to take the risk of letting me point literally exactly that camera I'm pointing at right now at them to bring it into their church and to trust that I won't make them look bad. That is such a kindness. It's a risk that can be hard to properly explain, but there's a lot of ways to sabotage somebody with a camera. And so it is really cool of them to trust that we want to have the conversation in good faith together. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for how you treat the people who are kind enough to host us in the comment section. I think you do a great job of that. I respect you for it. Thank you to the people who are willing to host and let us into their world and see how these things work and encourage us with certain things and challenge us with other things. And maybe occasionally, and I don't think this is a bad thing either, make us scratch our heads at certain other things that we just don't really understand as outsiders. I think that's awesome. I think you're awesome. I think that little girl who did the intro, I think she's pretty solid too. That was a, that was a solid debut. We might have to do that one again. All right. We got more of this to come. Sit down interview coming up next. I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.